This is Computing Up, conversations about computation writ large with Michael Littman and Dave Ackley. This episode was recorded September 14th, 2022. Dave, I'm super excited. So do you remember when we first started to hang out a little bit at Belcor, one of the things, well, you invited me over to your apartment. That was super cool. And Jeez. I was amazed because your apartment was just, it was, I don't know, decorated, let's call it decorated with just walls of books. You just oh. had, you had read so much stuff. And for me, reading is always a bit of an effort, but you had just absorbed so much reading stuff. And I asked you at the time, like, can you recommend a couple things? And you let me read, oh, I want to say the moon is a harsh mistress and uh -huh. postman. Like you gave me some like books that in retrospect, oh, uh, Ender's Game, like that I really have in enjoyed being able to look back on and as having read because huh. they introduced some really cool ideas and they come up in popular culture sometimes and I just feel better and well-rounded for having gotten your recommendations and, and read those books. Yeah, it is important to point out that that th those walls of books were pretty much all science fiction, uh, yes. uh, although <laughs> some fantasy and whatnot, I, it's uh, ecumenical. Uh, uh, that's right. fair. That's fair. Right. It, in my head, I had said that, but in out loud, I did not say it. So <laughs> there was, yeah, there was a genre of books that was most attractive to you, but a lot of it involved really sort of creative thinking about the world as it could be the world as it as it might evolve into in the future and you know you you know if i can say like you're a very philosophical thoughtful person and and i think that it kind of it kind of worked for me now my understanding is that you've done less of that as you you know became a professor and were responsible for other things uh, it's true i i don't read as much science fiction as i used to but uh, but still it it kind of it formed quite a foundation for you from a from a perspective of thinking well, about the world and thinking about well, technology absolutely. I mean, so, sure, sure. Yeah. So, okay. So this is why I think this is going to be so much fun. So we have as our guest today, an actual book author. Uh, his name is John Twelve Hawks, and he's written four novels. Uh, I don't, I don't know that he would consider them to be science fiction per se, but a lot of them are very much grounded in, in sort of speculative future thinking. And so I think it, it may overlap with, with some of your interests there. And um, another really interesting thing about him is that the, the John Twelve Hawks is a pseudonym. He's his his actual name and appearance are not not known. Um, but he's he's super cool. I got to talk to him because he he's writing a new book that it, that touches on computing and AI, and uh, he just wanted to hear some some background stuff. And I thought, oh man, I would love for to be in a conversation with him and Dave. So guess what? He's here. here we are. Uh, John wow, Twelve Hawks. Great. Thank you so much for coming to Computing Up. Pleasure and honor to um, actually be in the same cyber room with um, with both of you. Well, well, fantastic. So we decided that uh, to take advantage of this, you know, this momentous occasion of getting getting to talk to John Twelve Hawks, is that we're actually going to try to solve the world's problems, and in particular, uh, we're going to focus in a little bit on some of the issues that came up in his current book. So. John, would you be able to kind of catch us up a little bit? What 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 can you tell us about the new book, and what issues has it raised for you? Yeah, I, I think it, it was initially based upon the foundations of the previous books. Um, I actually see myself as a dystopian writer about uh, trying to understand the era that we are currently living in, take things which are currently occurring and then push them a little bit farther, maybe 10 or say 20 years in the future. In the earlier novels, I focused on what I saw was the end of privacy in digital countries. And virtually everything that I predicted 15 years ago has come true in terms of privacy no longer exists. It was interesting that when The Traveler, my first novel came out, the general idea was he's crazy, he's paranoid, this is never gonna happen. It all has indeed occurred. Now, so, now can I just comment? So if you yeah. think of yourself as a dystopian writer, and if we currently live in something that to a lot of us looks a little dystopian, does that make your job harder or easier, right? Because it's already feels like we're in a, we're in a big mess at the moment. I would say the thing that makes it harder is that there's a lot more information. So the current massive novel that I just finished the first draft on, the one that both you guys have partially read a certain section of required 
hundreds of articles I had to read and assimilate and also books. This is why I contacted you guys is that it's important to me, it's important to my readers that the facts, even though I push them, even though I dramatize them, are true facts. Um, good, good. So that's probably the easiest way to kind of do it. Um, I, this current novel is about two things. It's about machines that are going to start acting like people and people acting like machines. And um, it raises a variety of complicated issues that are currently playing out, not in fiction, but in reality right now. The major one being is that, is there an existential threat from a computer that would have general intelligence that's able to modify its own system? Now, this is an idea which has been talked about theoretically. I think the most, uh, I'd say, famous start of it was in a uh, year 2000 article in Wired by um, Bill Joy, the co-founder and chief uh, scientist at Sun Microsystems, right. um, where he basically everything is summed up in Um, Elon Musk um, have pointed out the possible danger of a sentient computer that can that can think and actually modify its own program. So as a start, I would throw it back to you two guys and say, is that is that theoretically possible? Yeah. Well, you know, we've talked about it a little bit. We've had some guests on that we've touched on it a little bit, but we haven't we haven't gone super deep into it. And you know, all all I have is kind of gut feelings about the way systems work and about the way computers work, since you've know, done a lot of that. Uh, um, and I feel like. Is there any risk? Sure, there there is some risk. Is the risk species threatening? Uh, uh, then I don't know that I think it's any more species threatening than lots of other things that don't involve computers, uh, like biological stuff and, and so on and so forth. And to me, you know, there's tons of this existential risk AI super intelligence stuff out there. And I think if I had to guess that a lot of it is based on intelligence overestimating itself. It, it's a lot of it is based on uh, the idea of an intelligent creature thinking the most important thing is being intelligent uh, rather than, for example, being extremely powerful and, and owning a gigantic corporation or, or running an autocracy uh, over a billion of people, something like that. A and my feeling is after thinking about this a lot and doing work in AI and neural networks and computer security, Security and so forth over the years that intelligence overrates itself uh, by a lot. And that's why this idea of the super intelligent AI seems so threatening. Because we think, you know, man, if I was just a little smarter, then, whoa, I'd be the king of the world. Uh, I'd be, you know, whatever like that. Uh, uh, when, and and that's just not true, you know, that, that my future, my degree of money, power, success is limited by so many things more than just my ability to think of the next idea. Does that make any sense? Yeah, and I can extend this is that I think one of the problems that many, um, I'd say, technology writers have, have, they have the same problem as many science fiction writers. They get hung up on the idea of a computer or a machine being sentient. In other words, it's very much of a human-centered evaluation of, oh, this is this is going to be a, a a box that is going to think like a human, act like a human, have human emotions. I doubt very seriously if that is going to happen. 
the real issue is exactly what you just said, David, is that if there is a system or a machine that's autonomous and has a vast degree of data set and is powerful, is that is the power of a, a system like that going to be a dangerous thing? And I would right. say that it is, as long as we don't put ourselves in a bag like, oh, it is going to demand that uh, it has to listen to Mozart or, or Beethoven. No, it's not <laughs> going to be that way. It's, it's going to want to preserve itself, I yeah. think, is the number one objective. Well, I, I, I totally agree. Uh, I, I, I talk about my sort of philosophical approach to life and my entire research career as being living computation, focusing on the relationship between living systems and computational systems. And for me, the definition of a living system is a pattern that does work to preserve itself. That's what life is. And if we look out in the world and we see patterns that are appear to be doing work to preserve themselves, we say, hey, look at that. It's kind of alive. And so the, the short answer is I, I embrace computational paganism, that wherever you look out in the world, if you see a pattern doing work to preserve itself, then you say that is life. That is what life is. So and com computation in the big picture is how you choose what work to do to try to preserve your pattern. That's what computing is. And, and so people ask, you know, how does where does meaning come from, for example? And, and, and I say, well, the answer is, is, is that meaning comes from the fact that you're trying to work to preserve this pattern. And you can always trace it back to, well, there's a, you know, this particular piece of code, this particular utterance, whatever it is, was part of this particular pattern doing work to preserve itself. And that's the meaning, that's the ultimate meaning. And and all the rest of it derives from that. So but, then the question, go ahead, wait, so Michael. Can we get back? So, so, so John was raising, you know, sort of threat issues. And I feel like you've in the past, Dave, you talked about the, that in, in many ways, the danger is not so much the super intelligent machine that controls the resources. It's the highly nonlinear resources, right? Like right. one button push can destroy, a, you know, a hundred square miles. That's, that is a very dangerous thing in the hands of a human and in the hands of uh, right. or, or in the circuits of a, a machine. Right. So, the, so that last point about having this big system and putting the AI on top of the system, most of the danger resides in the system and not in the AI that is supposed to be charged with pushing or not pushing the button like that. And what we really need to be thinking about is, do we want to be building systems that are capable of such unbelievable damage at the push of a simple button? like that. I mean, that's Hair the trigger. definition. The definition of a weapon is a simple switch that causes massive damage uh -uh, like that. And, you know, I want to, and again, that's why I think the intelligence part is a little bit of a red herring uh, because it kind of justifies looking away from the systems, the hellfire missiles, the, the right. nuclear holocaust and so on and so forth and saying, oh, that's okay. We'll make our AIs take philosophy uh, uh, and it'll be okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, you know, or, or whatever it is. And, and to me, that just seems just silly uh, uh, like that. It, it doesn't matter whether it's an AI or a crazy person or whatever that's pushing the button. It's the fact that the button exists and could be pushed that is where we need to focus. Um, one of the more, um, I'd say, interesting interviews I had with a specialist about this book is that I was down in Johns Hopkins talking about the way machines use language, how they understand language and how they speak language. And then everything is done and we're, we're having like a drink, some white wine. And I'm going, well, what else is going here? And she said, well, a colleague of mine is, has been working on this fascinating stuff about psychopaths. And then she started to talk about psychopaths, okay? And <laughs> it kind of blew my mind because not in terms of thought, the way humans think and the way that I say machines think, but in terms of behavior, unfortunately, a particular kind of system could kind of be like 
a psychopath in that right, right, no yeah. no emotional connection, highly rational, um, knows yeah. how to manipulate people, and and that's what gave me some troubled sleep afterwards. You guys, yeah. I have to say that. Yeah, that's I, fair. I think that's that. I think that is fair, and I think that points. You know, so when people say we we should ban AI research or no, no, no. Or, or something like that, well, whatever. I mean, people yeah. do say it. Uh, um, my feeling is more that well, we can't. It's going to happen whether we ban it or not. But what we need to do is make a culture of respect for life, uh, and that that we we need to generously think about extending the franchise of considering something to be life and maybe someday considering it to be intelligent, maybe someday considering it to be sentient or to have rights uh, um, in our computational paganism way uh, so that we we won't act like jerks. Uh, I mean, I, you see those Boston Dynamics videos with the robot dogs and the humans <laughs> kicking the robot dogs trying yeah. to knock them over. And I keep thinking, you know, Christ, in 50 years, the robots are going to see that video <laughs> and they're going to say, screw you, humans. This is what you did to baby us uh, uh, like that, you know. And that's really interesting that you say it, because I think a lot of people have that very visceral reaction to the videos. And I actually was at a uh, I don't know, let's call it a cocktail party. It was some kind of a, a gathering with Mark Raybert, who's the the, sure, the, the, the person who created Boston Dynamics. Boston Dynamics. And I said, you know, those videos, like it's really hard for people to watch those. Like, I think maybe maybe you could find a way to present the, the, the amazing things that these systems are doing to react to unexpected inputs that don't look like abuse. And he laughed at me <laughs> and yeah, that was the yeah, end of yeah. the conversation yeah, because I, I really know. don't think he has, he's having that kind of reaction for him. It's just, it's just a system that's reacting to inputs and he wants to demonstrate that. But right. to a lot of people watching it, 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 yeah, there's this paganistic kind of like, it's kind of alive. Like it is making an effort to stay balanced and you keep thwarting it. Like at some point it's going to get pissed at you. <laughs> I would, I would add here um, and perhaps Anyone listening to this might find this interesting. I probably know more about sex bots than <laughs> just about anyone in the United States these days. And making of sex bots, how they work, uh, vaginal cartridges, which is which is which is a thing. How you clean them, how you clip them in, how you take them out, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> Teledildonics is a phrase I've right, heard. Did right. that come up? <laughs> right. uh -oh. So, so, but this, you see, this is how humans and machines begin to get intertwined <laughs> because, um, and this is highly regrettable, but those people I've talked to involved in sex bots, most of them being the advances are being made in China and also Japan for a variety of demographic reasons is that there aren't as many women because, yeah. because of the, the population mix. And there is a definite market for what would be called kitty bots. In other words, robot humanoids that look like children. Now, this is where exactly wow. what you're talking about, kicking that dog, right. okay? Right. Does this become permissible? Does it lower humanity this it once we begin to see well it's a machine you know though it looks like a human being i mean it it's it's a it's a tangled web Maybe yeah and it's not so simple yeah, no no, no yeah. it's very complicated because there's yeah. there's a there's a well-known roboticist who's been arguing that we should be making kitty sex bots for pedophiles Absolutely. with the idea like with and he and he means this in the most positive possible way which is the idea that if we can if we can help these people who have these urges that they can't control channel those urges into something that doesn't involve hurting people then that's a net win and yet everybody's response to this is yikes mm -hmm. and and i don't really know like I, I i understand the argument but i have no idea whether this is actually putting us on a terrible road yeah. i would say though that there are very few people in the industry in general that are asking these kinds of questions, which is why um, usually when I talk to people who are involved with the computer industry or the technology industry, 
they always say the same thing. Oh, I know all about that. And that, because they know about it, gives them an excuse not to think about it or do anything about it yeah. as well. No. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, one of the one of the lines I used in a I don't know a, a Huffington Post thing or a lot many years ago or something that um, my feeling is is that if we do actually start building in extremely intelligent, very very capable uh, AIs, uh, our concern will not be keeping them uh, down, but raising them right, and the issues of uh, silicon machines versus carbon machines right. that we are are differences in degree they are not qualitative differences to me because they're they're all machines i'm a machine we have just lots of different kinds of machines once we get past that very simple-minded deterministic tick tock newtonian clockwork thing and we admit that machines can have all kinds of random pseudo random quantum who the heck knows behavior uh, uh, well then, okay. Then I, I don't see a big difference between you know machines that we manufacture and machines born of man. Uh, uh, and we should be doing a much better job raising machines born of man uh, uh, if we actually want to solve the problem of people being psychopathic and 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 doing very sad things. And, and, and so machines forth. being psychopathic too. At, yeah. Well, and, that, and my point is is that it's the same thing. Right. That I they're understand. actual. That that in fact all roads lead to Rome, there is a sense of healthy computing. There is a sense <laughs> of healthy outlook. There is a sense of uh, respecting the franchise. That if I am talking to someone and they understand the code that I am sending them, then they, assuming they run the code too, uh, are entitled to their fair share of the franchise. Uh, and wait, that's so what, what is this word "franchise" in. to me? Is like McDonald's. What What do you mean in this context? <laughs> the The franchise is the organization that that we are part of, and and my oh, suggestion, my suggestion, maybe. the community, the society, okay. like that. I see, I see. And I see. and so you, so we had a, a, a our guest. Uh, Tina Iliasi Rod uh, many months ago, who was talking about democracy and, yeah. and stuff like that, and uh, thinking about what democracy is, and and that was where I was going to think of what the the fundamental core of democracy is that if you run the code, that we are all equal in this. If you run the code, you're entitled to your fair share of the franchise, the the to benefit uh, uh, like that. And if if we can. Spread that if we could spread that i mean you know i'm a hopeless idealist this is this is obvious this episode is, is bringing it out in me uh, um but i think that would be where we actually want to spend the effort that will help our children and our machines to come i think that my duty as a fiction writer is to portray to create and portray human beings that are literally having to deal with this okay and how 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 they do it, um, keeping on sex bots just for one more beat. One of the chapters uh, early in this massive novel, one of my characters goes at night to a sex bot brothel. And what a fiction writer does is you think, or you have to think, what's it going to look like? What what's going to happen there? What is he going to do? OK, and all of a sudden I realized he would probably be carrying a flash drive, which is now nicknamed a sex drive. OK, and that he, uh, there's a pun that I can really appreciate. Yeah, he, <laughs> he's going to plug in the flash drive to the sex bot, the hardware, and, yeah, and she'll instantly know his name, who he is, conversations they've had in the past, what his particular peculiarities are. Okay, so rather than store this intimate stuff on a server where maybe someone can get at it, he'll be carrying his sex drive as physically as with him. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> and so that's what you try to do as a novelist is that Ooh. all these ideas that you guys are expert on is what are the human implications of it right you know well certainly it's always about the systems that our machines 
are going to be embedded in. And, you know, one of the, one, one phrase that drives me absolutely crazy is the phrase unintended consequences, uh, ah. uh, like that, because to me, that is the poster child of, yeah, but they were so obvious that if you had given it a little bit of thought, you would have seen that that was an obvious consequence. And the fact that you didn't intend it means like little to nothing. Uh, um, and that we have to get more serious about <laughs> taking a, a system view. <laughs> what i don't know that seems a, maybe a little unfair it is some of these things are you're it's you can definitely use that as an excuse right a person can use that as an excuse oh it's an unintended consequence that right. they actually did foresee but didn't want to pay attention to but well, some cases it can be the, the interactions are really subtle yes, like i yes, feel like yes, yes. the idea of creating recommender systems to like tell you what to what what uh you know what sneakers to get or what video to watch next like i think the people working on that really did not foresee that it would somehow get turned in on itself as a way of of radicalizing right. people right and well, that but was the, an unintended consequence well yeah so but to me there's a, this general principle that if you were going to deploy stuff on people if you're going to deploy mm. stuff on humans, the humans are going to react. And that's the part that we always kind of skip and yeah. then say, oh, yeah. that's an unintended consequence. And I think that is unacceptable in this day and age that okay. you, ha you have to be willing to turn the crank and say, OK, now when people realize all of their choices are being mined to make selections to make that, what right. are they going to do? Gonna How do are next? they going to yeah. counterplay? Right. Uh, right. Like Play that. the chess game out a little bit. Exactly. I would. I would argue that there was a historical moment in in scientific history that in an odd way duplicates what is going on right now and that moment was the manhattan project yeah the wow. development of nuclear power and a nuclear bomb i have right. read endlessly about this there are diaries people kept at los alamos yeah. okay and it was cool science and it was exciting every day was exciting and all these smart guys were there it's it's exactly like what is happening right now and yet they are curiously innocent yeah that's Would the you, end of innocence this, that's exactly this, the phrase this, i was thinking this is not yeah. what is what is going on people are not pernicious they're not you know snidely whiplash twirling <laughs> his mustache okay it's just they are either deliberately endless or it's a really cool stuff they are doing it's an endless problem they love to solve but they really don't think about the human implications of yeah. what they are possible and i think that's legit i think that the, that the physicists had a end of innocence moment when they saw the bomb deployed and i think it <laughs> absolutely it, i think the field's been different ever since that there is much more of an awareness of like wait a second what what's the next step here what how can this go off the rails and i think the computer science managed to last until i don't know i would say 2016 like to i think our end of innocence moment was 2016 when not to be political about it but when the election happened a lot of people said wait a second why what and they've traced it back to these these not even intelligent systems but ai-ish systems right that were that were helping to you know uh filter people's news feeds and that there was something really unfortunate in in, in the way that those were, were acting and i think that ever since then the field has been much more i mean i don't think we're as advanced as the physicists yet but i think that there's a real acknowledgement in the in the computer science field that we need to pay attention to to the societal implications we we just did it before well, the, I, I wish I agreed with you, Michael. I, I'll, I'll just say one thing and then I'll shut okay, up. No, no. I, I feel like a, a lot of what we're getting now is like ethics washing. Uh, uh, and it, it's really a little bit more on the say the words, throw some money at it and not change anything fundamental. Uh, uh, and that's a concern that I have. That, uh, so I, I am a bad guy within the within the field uh, uh, in that sense. But I, I cut you off. No, John. the. Um analogy that I would use and is that obviously the orientation is towards more powerful systems. That's the path to academic prestige. That's the path to lots of money. Okay. So high tech is building more powerful, I'd say machines, but few people are thinking about the implications. To me, the analogy is it's like let's build a really fast automobile and you spend all your time on the engine 
but you're not really thinking about the steering wheel, okay? And so so the, the, these cars can go faster and faster and faster. They're more powerful. And yet, how do you steal it? What happens when it starts to skid? People, it's disproportionate in terms of the, 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 the time is spent on the power of the system rather than how you control it, how you channel it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 would, I would say one of the standard ways that you make something more powerful is by uh, centralizing it and eliminating uh, intermediate structure so that, you know, in, in the car analogy, it would be just getting rid of everything except for the engine and the wheels you know, reducing the weight completely so that it's all just, you know, a rocket with a handhold for the pilot or something like that. Uh, um, and that, that is terrible. That, that has, <laughs> that has real consequences, uh, re removing the checks and balances, removing the intermediate levels of structure and all of that stuff. And, uh, an awful lot of what we're seeing in the, the social media companies, the, the Google and Facebook, all of these things that, uh, centralize significant fractions of the human to human traffic that is now moving on the planet are going through Facebook servers or Google servers or, or what have you, or usually all of them. Uh, um, and that is a tremendous problem as far as I'm concerned. That's a tremendous risk. That So I think that's riding in parallel to your thoughts about powerful systems right. uh, uh uh but to me the the, mis the the mistake or even the evil of it is the centralization is the removal of all structure except the periphery and the center uh, um and making it into you know panopticons and and all of this kind of things that we have now all right so this um leads to an issue where i'm really going to defer to both you guys because you both are literal experts on this, okay, which is my outsider view is that um, in the last, I say, 10 years, um, computers are being built and run with vastly more, uh, usually the term is like um, parameters, uh, yeah. meaning the mm -hmm. for uh, a non-computer person, these would be the coefficients applied to say different calculations. So all this has increased speed and capabilities. Um, the growth of machines which are basically following what be called a foundation model meaning it can answer a broad spectrum of problems and not just i'd say one the problem with all this and i'm going to come to my question is it seems to be because it requires so much energy so much computing power that it's dominated either by governments or really large corporations is there any way to change that? Is there any way to create a system where Joe Idealist and Mary, I'm really smart, in their garage can do something that is not part of that system? That's yeah. my question. Possible you, you, you want to You want to take a crack at it, Michael? Sure, yeah. So, so uh, I, you, you listed... To, uh, a couple of reasons for why this kind of centralization is happening a lot now. One is yes. the mm -hmm. the massive computer power, but the other one I think that's really important is the massive data. And yes. so it's the companies that have collected lots and lots and lots of say human behavioral data, click data, and so forth that ha that have that raw material that these these machine learning algorithms require to ingest. So lots of text, lots of lots of clicks, lots of reactions of things. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think the problem is as bad as you say, and maybe worse, we can, you know, d d you know, Dave's working on a new architecture for computing that would allow the computing system itself to be more distributed, more decentralized, but that doesn't solve the data problem, right? So even if that helps with making the processing a little better, uh, or a little less centralized, the, the, the data, uh, these, these systems depend on data. Now, one thing I would say is that it's, I don't think it's a necessity, right? It is not the, like these systems that are learning to process language now read more than any human being has ever read. Maybe right. like the union of all people have read. 
Well, that's probably not true because everything that's written is probably read by somebody. So, but but they're reading more than a normal human being reads, and they're getting less out of it than people. So the current algorithms are really wasteful in terms of how much exposure they need to reach a certain level of competence, as it were. Um, as we develop algorithms that are less wasteful in that way, yeah, I mean, you you know, you said John and Mary in their garage, like they could make a person and make a smart person, like if, you know, if they like each other and stuff, they could probably do this on their own. <laughs> could you do that with a computer? Yeah, they'd be able to raise it the way that Dave was talking about before. So right. we just, but those algorithms don't yet exist. The only way we know how to make those kinds of systems today is by just inundating them with with examples until they can just almost luck into uh, a way of behaving that fits with those examples. So I, okay. Okay. I, I, I would, I would add two uh, points to what Michael okay. said. Uh, so one is uh, there is, you know, these gigantic models uh, uh, like many large systems, like many complex systems, uh, you know, the first one costs a billion dollars and all the rest are free uh, uh, like that of a, a specific piece of machinery and the poster child for that now is um uh, uh stable diffusion uh right. that uh, people spent whatever it was six figures to train this thing up and with a with a enough data to choke uh, a horse choker uh, um <laughs> and, and but now it's whatever it is it's it's three gigabytes of parameters of these weights that you're talking about uh, um and anybody can have them and furthermore, you can do like little add-on tunings. So the fact that you couldn't afford to do the, what Stable Diffusion has got distilled into it yourself doesn't mean you can't do cool learning little bits and stuff in your garage with your GPU, your uh, uh, stuff that you've bought, because you use the Stable Diffusion as part of as your a starting pipeline. point. Yeah, as now, a and starting just point. and just to just to point out for people. Stable diffusion in this case is referring to the ability to turn like little text descriptions into elaborate pictures, right? Right. Yeah. Well, and and then you can do all these tricky things with it. You know, you can kind of run it backwards and you can kind of take part of a picture and turn that into a prompt and then turn that into more of a picture. Uh, uh, all of this stuff that, that you can do. So, and, and again, that's just the sort of the early stages of it like that. Uh, um, and so in that sense, uh, maybe there's some hope that it only takes a few philanthropists to put out a few of these incredibly big things. Uh, uh, and the other point was that, you know, uh, um, you know, Michael was talking about how you, you need the data and unless you are one of these gigantic things, uh, uh, you can't get the data. And, you know, the view that I'm doing, the, the kind of computing that I'm trying to work on is this idea of build bottom up uh, uh, and make structure at all scales. So you are going to have computers that are yours, not not just in the bullshit personal computer sense that we use it now, but in the sense that, you know, they will die for you, uh, that sort of thing, that, that they actually know you. All they do is study you uh, and uh, they uh, uh, will not give you information away. They will defend you and all of this kind of stuff. And so, in fact, they can come up with a ton of data, but it's all about you uh, uh, like that. And uh, that that could be uh, enough. It, it becomes uh, sort of a boy and his daughter. Dog, uh, kind of, of scenario that that you have this thing that is your best friend in a completely weird little machinery sense, uh, uh, but it's trustworthy because it knows you down to the actual space you currently occupy in the world. It knows right where you are. It can't be fooled. It can't be saying, "Oh, I've got, I stole your password. Now I can be you." This thing is so much closer to you, so much more intimate with you that it's what a personal computer should have been. <laughs> That's my story about how there will be ways for even not. Well, I mean, it's going to cost a billion dollars to make the first of these personal computers, so we're still going to need the philanthropist. We'll see what happens from there. Everything you have described is in this new novel. Okay. Dun, dun, everything dun. Dun. Every, everything <laughs> you just said. Is, is there a GitHub <laughs> repo for the code? <laughs> <laughs> so I will add a generalized comment being in terms of this three part uh, conversation, the only civilian involved, you two guys are experts, but the hardest thing to explain to people who are not, don't know how computers work is that they think 
that the computer is actually thinking, that the computer is listening to them just like a human being is, whereas what's actually going on is what you guys just described in the last five minutes, okay, is that there's massive amounts of data from human beings, right. from human beings speaking or, or making decisions or picking something on Amazon. And so the computer is basically using probabilities in terms of both making decisions about what we want to buy best next or what we need to buy on Amazon. So it seems like the computer is actually thinking, but it's not. It's taking millions of human words and responses and using those to sound and feel like an actual human being okay right so, so yeah so it, yeah. it's a it's a it's a con it's a right. hollywood false <laughs> it is, front is a uh, hollywood con okay. uh, 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 like at some level absolutely but on the other hand people think their dog <laughs> listens to them uh, i understand uh, that no 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 <laughs> it's there it's there so and <laughs> Apropos, I, I would I would hate to go back to sex spots again, but I started it, so I can I can I can actually bring this in. It always comes back to sex. Spots. Is that what is current now on the cutting edge of this? Is that there's a standardized program for making the person making the bot talk and making the bot respond in a certain way? If you have a lot of money, okay you can have what's called a girlfriend experience. And, and what that involves is this. Now, this is, this is exactly what you're talking about, David, okay? Is that a human being will wear sensors on her or him and have a microphone. And then we'll have dialogue, we'll move a certain way, responding to the client's demand, okay? And so that there's a generalized program, but then the particular program that you were describing is, is again going to come from a human being being basically downloaded into a machine. Wait, wow. So wait, so you're saying if I pay all this money for the girlfriend experience, then it's like Amazon Mechanical Turk. There's somebody there listening to my sex conversation and no, saying, no, no, oh, no, baby, no, baby. No, no, no. Uh, no. So, so, so that out of the box, once you take it out I of the see, box I see. I'll get it a together. It custom know, trained for it, me. It will know, oh, so you're really into painting yourself blue you know i that's that's what i've always liked that's my favorite thing <laughs> right right, right. Uh, uh. so 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 again the con as you yeah. just put it is that it seems like a machine came out of the box really liking blue but, but no it's been I that's see. already yeah. been downloaded into it okay right. yeah, so yeah. and and how can we as mere mortals understand or figure out what is human what's a machine what's real what is sentient what's a fantasy i mean yeah yeah it's it's going to be a fascinating but a difficult next 20 to 30 Four years well you know i think i think the the answer to all of those <clears throat> is we can't <laughs> um and <laughs> and and well and we just we need to live with that and sorry we can't where, what? we can't know uh, if oh. the thing is real, we can't know exactly how automated it is. We can't know how human is the chat bot that I'm dealing with or on this, the on the shopping website. This picture that, that I'm looking at, is it actually what it seems to be? Right. Or is it, uh, you know, a creation, but it's being customized in real time based on my eye movements or whatever. Uh, um, and the point I, 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 will, I will go back to my hobby horse, not sex bots, but computational paganism <laughs> that that we just have to give up on it's human or it's not it's consciousness or not. It's not sentient or it's not. And we have to admit that those things are all spectrums, uh, uh, spectra of ranges of sentience, ranges of humanity. Uh, and we can change the focus to how can we be more human? How can our machines be more human? Not how can we have a bit flip that it says this is not human therefore i can kick the crap out of it because it's just a machine that's where the mistake is made uh, um and so uh, we'll, we'll see uh, i'm sure real soon everybody's going to buy into computational paganism and it'll be a better world let me ask you a question
question. Let me, I'm going to, and this Shoot. is a are an practical question. Cow. Okay. Shoot. These, these are actually being considered. Um, can a machine um, own a, own a copyright? Can a machine have yeah. a bank account? Hold on. Last yeah, yeah. question. What do you do if, if a machine kills someone? Yeah. Uh, uh, since I literally, genuinely, sincerely, to the bottom of my soul, believe that I am a machine, the answer is yes to all of those. Uh, uh, How do uh, you put like a that. machine in prison, Dave? <laughs> because Dave is a machine. You could put Dave in prison. That's uh, uh, his, like that. He, it's he, no he different than putting the question. Me. He dodged yes, the I question. Did. He dodged I did the not. question. The, ca- <laughs> the, he, the question was about, you know, Things that other people call machines. So like oh, a computer, a, yeah. a, a telephone, a car. Uh, right? uh, so can you can put a, a computer, car in prison? Can a computer have a copyright? Can a computer own yeah. property? Can a computer have a bank account? Can a computer be arrested for killing someone? Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, as far as I know, you know, most of those questions are legal questions. Uh, yeah. They are, well, really, um, yeah, yeah, they're, yeah. They're, they're not something that can be answered on first principles uh, um, because the line of, you know, computer that just, you know, computers today, computers today go. are a pitiful joke. Uh, uh, so again, it's, it's, the, it's the Hollywood con, it's reality, a hundred miles wide and one pixel deep. Uh, um, and so we, we know. All, all of those things, no. That that would be like drawing a picture, you know, taking a piece of paper and writing "person" on it, and then saying "arrest that." Uh, uh, that that would be about as well as we were going. But but we're just getting going. We are just getting going. Yeah. And, and and once we get beyond determinism and beyond the kind of little teeny area of manufactured computers that we've been clustering ever ever since von Neumann in the forties, uh, uh, we will start to be able to build much more complex, much larger, much more capable, much more sensible machines and and then it becomes absolutely gray uh when we start giving them agency either as a a personal friend like we talked about or as someone who has rights or someone who has obligations and could be put in jail so you know down the road that's your job uh uh, (laughs) to show us what it's like when machines get to that point but they're not there I, now. That's the point. I, I am a positive person, so I, 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 will, I will leave this on a positive note, um, is that if anyone hears this in the future or if, or if it's in a time capsule somewhere and someone is listening to this 50 years from now, at least for an hour, three people endeavored to answer and to raise and answer some highly difficult questions. And unfortunately not a lot of people are actively doing that so it is a privilege to talk to you both and this is what we have to be doing we have to ask these questions and try to answer them well well john 12 hawks i i really really enjoyed this conversation and uh i'm really glad that michael brought us all together Mm -hmm. to talk about it again and you know maybe down the road we'll 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 get back together and we'll talk about some more once this uh, yeah we definitely there's some book comes out uh uh we could uh you know get on on the 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 tail end of the massive publicity tour uh uh like that and uh, they don't have publicity tours anymore (laughs) yeah 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 well it's just you know next zoom room next zoom room (laughs) Uh, um, (laughs) uh, like that Uh, um, but uh, just it was a lot of fun to to meet with you and have this conversation a pleasure this was computing up thanks for listening